it's just yeah it's just when you've been driving all night long the sun's about to come up and you're like i just need to get home yeah and i'm gonna go to sleep and forget this ever happened and home has seemed so far away just out of reach Mm -hmm. home just seems just out of reach just out of reach but you know what's always in reach what's that hey there everybody welcome back to pixelit my name is kevin alongside with me as always is phil and Hello. today we're starting a brand new book. Oh, oh, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> this is going to be interesting. Oh, uh, yeah. So, Phil, we are reading Mortal Kombat, which Mortal came Kombat. out in 1995. Yes. Uh, the book, I mean, uh, Mortal Kombat uh, by Jeff Roven. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you know about Mortal Kombat, Phil? Uh, I mean, that was, that was Mortal Kombat was, uh, one of those first video games I can recall growing up in the nineties. And, and it was the first one where parents seemed concerned. Yeah. Like obviously that we, we have a grand history of video games where parents are concerned, but sure. Mortal Kombat really stirred the turd. It really got some shit started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I I didn't I was a Street Fighter kid. I didn't play much Mortal Kombat, but it yeah. was legendary just because everyone was talking about the fatalities. You know, this is and this is our first fighting game book, isn't it? It is. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, yeah, fighting game. Uh, it did a lot of at first. It did a lot of uh, the. Oh, what would you call it? It, it was actual photos. It was, yeah, it was like rotoscoped uh, pictures of right. actors that they they basically got all the they they took us uh, like photographs of and or in video of and kind of stitched it together. So, right. It had this seamless look of. Um, yeah, uh, it was a, it was a weird way to do graphics. Yeah. And it, and it was all about brutality and blood and, yeah. you know, it was the first video game of its kind that had a system where after you'd won the fight, you could still do a move. Right. Like the fatality system. That was such a strange because that was just for the fun of it. That was just an yeah. Easter egg that you there was learned. no Yeah, you didn't need to do it. You just. No, it was no, something you that game, you, you won the game. It was it was something that was whispered about on the playground. Right. Right. Um, and you could find it in, in, you know, Electronic Gaming Monthly or Game Pro would have like right, you know, a list of the, fatalities, the, the combos in yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I remember there was a big deal between it being on Super Nintendo versus it being on the Genesis, because on the Genesis, it was uncensored. Um, yes. And on the Super Nintendo, you needed to enter a code in order to yeah. to actually get the blood. I think that's I'm remembering it correctly. Did it was it an actual code? I, I think I, there was I, a blood code. Yeah, uh, uh, to turn it on. Yeah, speaking as a Sega kid, um, I didn't I didn't own my first SNES until like long after the GameCube had come out. Uh, right, but it was it was one of the only things that people could be jealous about you for. Uh, having a Genesis, unless they were just real big fans of Shining Force, which uh, which I was. Let's, me too. <laughs> let's be honest. <laughs> you the, you know what? As a fan of tactics based RPGs, the pickings oh, the pickings were slim, and uh -huh. and Shining Force was it was pretty damn a pretty damn good one. So. <laughs> Not half bad. I still play it from time to time. I beat it like I beat the first one. I want to oh, say two years ago or nice. something. Just yeah. for the fun of it. That it's a great series. It, it's a fun series. I never played the third one because I didn't have a I want to say it came out on the Saturn. Um well, they had a third one that came out on the Game Gear that I was a huge fan of. Okay. Yeah, uh, I had the Game yeah. Gear one as well. I think there was one yeah. on the Saturn too. Um, I think well, actually, I think there are like oh, like over a dozen of them now. Like really? it came out on the Saturn. It's it's still that franchise is still crazy popular. Huh. Ah, the yeah, latest they're release not even called 20... Shining Force anymore. It's Shining whatever. Yeah, the know? latest release, Shining Resonance Refrain in March 2018. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. It's, it's all over the place. I and I think they I think they go through different genres too. So I I don't think they're tactical uh games anymore necessarily, but I could be totally wrong there. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like Final Fantasy. It's the same kind of deal, you know. Right. They're not necessarily connected. It's all just kind of a it's they all have they're all different flavors of LaCroix. It's all the same. It's but all they the have same. different aromas. Did you ever <laughs> did you ever play the first one? Um, 
the uh, the shining in the darkness. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the that was old a dungeon style. trailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had that one too. Yeah, actually, I literally I'm looking at it. I have it on my bookshelf right over there. <laughs> oh man, we're talking about. Uh, we're, I, I totally forgot. We're talking about Mortal Kombat. We're not talking Mortal about Shining Force. But I'm going to go ahead and do a quick search to see if there are any novelizations of Shining Force. But and uh, yeah, I I can't remember. I liked no. <laughs> Mortal Kombat. I guess I remember having it, and it was just kind of like a game I played. But I wouldn't call myself yeah. a Mortal Kombat super fan by any stretch of imagination. No, me either. Mortal Kombat was um, the people who the favorite game of more the people whose favorite game was Mortal Kombat. You know, were I had a bunch of friends who were like that, who loved that, and Mortal Kombat was kind of like for a while there. If that was your favorite game, that was all you fucking played. Yeah. Uh, you learned everybody's move set, that kind of thing. Of course, nowadays with fighting games, I guess that really hasn't changed. All yeah, that much. people have their own. I mean, and there's so many fighting games now, um, mm -hmm. especially now, you know, more fighting games. Uh, there was a time where it seemed like fighting games. It was rare that they would get imported over from Japan. Like there was a lot yeah. more in Japan than there were over in the States. Uh, but now there's just so many to choose from uh, yeah. that you really can find your own flavor that you like and stick with it. Oh, absolutely. Abs and people do, you know, and, and it's it's uh, ah, shut up, you. The Syria is Syria is yelling at Phil. My, my Kindle. This is what I get. For oh, your Kindle. A Kindle. Yeah. Your Kindle's yelling at you. It was trying to connect to the internet, and that's my problem for some reason. <laughs> what the fuck, Bezos? <laughs> Jesus. Um, so, uh, Mortal <laughs> Kombat. Uh, this book was written in 1995. Mm -hmm. It was written by a fellow by the name of Jeff Rovin. Jeff and, Rovin. And I thought it was interesting. It actually starts with a little note from him. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I loved this where the guy like basically everything that appears in the book outside the characters from the game, he developed out of uh, a lot of the mythology, the actual mythology from China. Um, yeah. So he wrote he read a couple books. He recommends Great Civilizations China by Ian Morrison, which sounds like a British guy. Sure. Uh, let's talk. Let's let the British guy do it. Uh, write the book. <laughs> and the wonderful alchemy, medicine, and religion in the China of AD 320. Uh, yeah. In particular, the James R. Ware translation. And actually, that name sounds familiar. I think I've I've read or skimmed through a, another Chinese book. Um, oh, okay. By you, uh, that, that was uh, the the so the original text, I believe, for uh, Sui Koden, um, which I did a video on several years ago, is a Chinese book, and I believe it was it was Ware who did the translation of that. Oh, that's cool. Okay, um, okay. If I'm recalling correctly, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, for a little background on our boy Jeff Rovin here. Um, he is uh, he he's a, like a lot of our guys, writer for hire. Uh, he's done some video game books. Uh, he actually did like how to play video game books. Uh, and he also did uh, he's done a lot of Tom Clancy novelization stuff, mm. just a lot of novelization in general, uh, including April Fool's Day, Reanimator, Cliffhanger, Broken Arrow and the game uh, all mid to late 80s mid to late 90s so classics he did a he did a novelization of the movie reanimator that's right which was an adaptation of this short story reanimator that's right <laughs> that's right he adapt he adapted an adaptation a photocopy of a photocopy <laughs> But I think, but here's the thing. I think the most interesting thing about Jeff Rovin might be that he was actually the editor in chief for Weekly World News. Huh. 
You mean like the Bat Boy? That is absolutely correct, sir. <laughs> For those of you playing the home game, Weekly World News was not just a tabloid, because tabloids is like, oh, you know, the, the queen's having a secret love affair with one of her bodyguards. Weekly World News was stuff like Satan's face seen in volcanic eruption over Maui or something like that. Yeah. Like they, Bat it was child found in cave. You, yeah. Everyone you have, if you are at home listening, you have seen this cover of yes. the bat child found in cave. And it's just this, this kid with gigantic eyes, a huge mouth and a pointy ears screaming. Yeah. Uh, the bat boy. Yeah. They made a musical based on that character. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and I bring all of that up because he's also had, a, he also has a very serious career uh, as a, just a general fiction writer he's written his own stuff he's he is a professional writer uh you know working stiff writer and uh very prolific like a lot of the guys we've read the work of yep uh and i but i only bring that up because i don't think there's any franchise out there that is more confusing in terms of its tone than mortal Kombat. yes because mortal Kombat, if you recall is a game about pulling the spinal columns out of your enemy uh while doing fatalities at the end and maybe friendships, babalities, who could, who could forget the ability to turn your opponent into a little baby version of themselves, uh, stuff like that. Um, but it also, when they are allowed to make something that isn't just a video game. And even then sometimes they get very deep and serious about the mythology yep. and the gods and the legends behind all of it. And you could break your neck with that kind of a tone yeah, shift. I there is there is zero worlds in which outside of this book I would make the effort to try to <laughs> learn right. the backstory in Mortal Kombat. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and there is plenty of backstory. <laughs> oh yes. And and oh and we're gonna get into it. <laughs> we're getting into it because it feels like this book might have been the inspiration for a lot of the 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 backstory that they they start shelling out later. I'm not yeah. sure well, uh, yeah, what the relationship I, I mean, between this book and the games is necessarily. I, I I don't know either, but I will say and 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 I also I, I didn't pass the first few. I think Mortal Kombat three was probably the last Mortal Kombat game that I played with any level of regularity at all. Um, so I haven't kept up with the mythology, with the world or anything like that. Every now and then a new one comes out or some DLC comes out and I stick my head into the room and say, you kids playing nice. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and like, oh, uh, you got, you got Jason from Friday the 13th in right, there now. He's right. Cool. That's cool. Is that, is that spawn? I didn't know you kids knew who spawn was. All right. All right. Good. <laughs> no, wait, I think that was actually, that was another game, but any case, is uh, that the Joker? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's injustice, dad. <laughs> Uh, it's a justice, which is just Mortal Kombat with DC pretty characters. Much. It's, it's exactly what it is. <laughs> but, so I, I guess what I'm saying is I haven't kept up with the tone and the storyline or anything. But from what I've seen, I feel like it hasn't changed all that much. No, but I, but I think you might be right. I think this might be uh, this might have shaped the future of how they treated Mortal Kombat uh, more than more than uh even people who play the game now might guess. Yeah. So yeah. the book starts with a prologue, which is just a full on creation myth yeah. about a God named uh, Pan Ku, um, who just e existed at the beginning of time and was the only thing to exist when basically when, when time started. Right. Um, then Pan Ku eventually dies and breaks apart and all of the body parts of Pan Ku create the various things in nature. Mm -hmm. um, that that about sums up the long and short of. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, including the gods. You like, know, yeah, different... the gods have become our different parts of of him. There is a there is a uh, there is a, a god named Tien, which um, 
So Panku dies, and there's a, a god called Tien, which is created, and the Tien creates the other gods. Right. Um, and then also creates, then the gods start creating beasts, and then eventually the gods get bored and create, create humans. Because, yes. like, uh, the beasts are too dumb and they need some something that'll get into trouble. So they right. start creating right. humans. And you know, like, oh, look at those humans. They're, they're so silly. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but they kind of they kind of have to back off then because they don't want to be, like, discovered by the humans or right. bothered by them. Exactly. So a lot there's a lot centered around a mountain. Uh, uh, Mount, yes, uh, uh, Mount Ifukube. Ifukube is. is basically the mountain on which they live. And um yeah, it's 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 just a full on creation myth and it's pretty it's it's kind of dense and it gets there's more in the creation myth uh that kind of gets teased out later. Yeah. Um but but it's it's like right off the bat here's like here's this creation myth you're going to need to remember some of this. <laughs> right. Right. Here's a little bit of background. It's going to help you to understand some motivations in here. But yeah, it is a straight up, uh, you know, it, it, there, there are so many aspects of it that feel, I mean, it, it feels kind of genuine uh, uh, as far as creation myths are concerned. Sure. Uh, I'm, I don't I don't know a ton about a lot of the old pagan uh, pantheons, but it does. It did have a lot of uh, similarities to Norse uh, mythology. Yeah, you know? and I, I, I don't uh, it might be um, I wouldn't be surprised given that he references those the books on Chinese mythology. I wouldn't be surprised right. if these are just basically lifted right out of those books. Be like I wouldn't either. Yeah, uh, this is uh, this is. This is some Chinese mythology, and here we go. Right, right, exactly. Uh, it, it, we have definitely never had a book that started off on this grand of a scale. We are literally, this is world building. Like, this is world building in the most literal sense of the word. He right. comes in and says, here's where the world came from. Here's where the people came from, the gods, the animals, the trees, and the flowers. And holy shit, that's that's a lot to start that's off with in your first three and a quarter pages. Yeah. Like, that's crazy. It is. Um, the uh, we move into chapter one, which sets us in AD 480. So yes. we're not we're not present day. We're not we're 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 back in the day. Um, and. The point of view is uh, uh, we get is a character named Kung Lao. Kung Lao. Kung yeah. Lao, who I did a quick search. Kung Lao was introduced in Mortal Kombat 2. Yeah, uh, him, and his, him uh, and his hat. Him and his hat, his razor yeah. bladed hat. But we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get to that. You know, we'll talk about this. Um, yeah, but basically, Kung Lao is in chapter one. He is discussing with his aunt uh, about like he wants to leave. He wants to right. he wants to go find the gods because he found a he found a piece of cloth that had writing on it, and yes. only he can see the writing. No one else can. He's like shown it to everybody. And like his aunt is like, uh, no, I can't see it either. What are you doing? Uh, and he is basically just trying to um, do something interesting with his life um, yeah. is, is kind of the vibe that I get. It, it's it's like a way vaguer version of, you know, the Disney princess I want song. Uh, yeah. He, he knows he's being called to some sort of higher purpose, uh, but he isn't sure what. And uh, we do f we do get a little background on his family. It gets it's really kind of it's a little insane because he's he's being cared for by his aunt because his dad's dead. Uh and because his, they 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 like he, well his dad died because he messed up with the proportions for gunpowder right and blew right. himself up 
Yeah, yeah, we got, uh, let's see. My father was hasty. I am not. Wasn't it I who warned him not to mix those powders and set them afire? Yes, she said. And after we buried what remained of him, didn't you return to the hills, collect more of those rocks, grind them together and burn them? I did, he admitted. I learned from father's example the correct proportions to use. It's like, this is, but you know what? It is the fifth century AD. Yeah, yeah. So like, that is how it's working at the time. It's like, we're still at a point where they're like, okay, those are new mushrooms. Let's, one of you eat them and let's see what happens to you when you eat that one. Like, are these fun ones or killer ones? <laughs> are these fun ones or killer ones? And we're like, oh, both. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. All right. Oh, his head went very far. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's, I it's, yeah I had that highlighted because I was like I was like reading 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 like wait what mm-hmm. <laughs> it kind of comes out like and that's the thing we we've talked about the creation myth and the gods and we've got this noble holy the total warrior. whiplash of Mortal Kombat is very <laughs> present right in this it, first scene. it's it doesn't waste any time it's like I'm a holy warrior and I want to go and learn how to be a holy warrior like. It's like, oh, okay, so your father was a holy warrior. Did he maybe, you know, die in a tournament like, or something? No, like that? he no. blew himself up with <laughs> gunpowder. He was he was smoking next to an oxygen we had tank. To collect, it didn't work out. We had to collect what remained of him to bury. <laughs> right. It's, it's it yeah, right off the bat. Right off the bat. We're like, oh, uh, and it, it it's so yeah, so he's just spending this time trying to convince his aunt to just let him go. And by the way, this clip of cloth he has that only he can read. Here's what it says, because you I know what you're thinking. You're like, oh, my God, well, he fa- whether anyone can read it or not, what is written on it must be some crazy direct religious shit to, like, push him towards this life. Right. You know, if he especially if he can only read it. I'm going to go ahead. I highlighted this part for you. Yeah. Uh, he cannot die yet does not live. Tis true. He is more than all. And all is pan ku. I gotta go to the mountain. So I gotta go to the mountain, I guess. <laughs> like, I don't know, man. I, I, I'd, I'd leave everyone who I loved, uh, and and sell all my possessions and and follow Jesus into the wilderness with that kind of problem. This oh, is, absolutely. This is really, uh, yeah. This is really direct. A direct call to action is what yeah. I would call this. Um, yeah. Uh, the other thing that I noticed and be like, I guess we're just we're just going to ignore the fact that why does it rhyme? Because <laughs> they had a good translator on it. That's they had a really funny. good translator who really yeah. works. It rhymes yeah. in both languages somehow. Right. That's uh, how good it is. That's, that's, that's how, how good, good it is. is. <laughs> I just I just imagine the author going, all right, guys, back off. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> what do you want from me? Yeah, if if I'd written it in Chinese or something, you'd be pissed off over that. Yeah, uh, yeah, and um, we get a little interest. He's got a he's got a he has kind of a girlfriend. His aunt does what aunts and grandmothers and mothers all over the world do with their bachelor sons. Uh, he's talking about leaving everything behind, leaving all his possessions, and going on this holy crusade. And then he like casually mentions, uh, "quote the egg girl Lee." Uh, and that they like to sit and talk. Mm. Uh, and she immediately goes, is Lee interested in you? And I was just like, oh, my God, mom, could you please? But that just I, my own mother's like, so do you have a girl? Is she is this one serious? Is, is this she good? nice? Is she nice? What's her parents like? You know, and just, she, she doesn't have any tattoos, does she? Sorry, mom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a little flashback here. It gets it's, it starts to get more and more specific. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit suspiciously so. Yeah. Um, my favorite line in this whole sequence, where uh, he's talking about the people that he showed the the piece of paper to or the thing to, um, is Doctor Chow drinks rice wine, but two people right. disagreed with you. <laughs> yeah. He's like, yeah, I went to Dr. Chow. He said, he, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. She's like, well, Dr. Chow drinks rice wine. Dr. Ha- Dr. Was- Chow's an alcoholic. Fuck him. I, but I, he disagreed yeah. with you. <laughs> yeah, it's the fifth century version of. Well, he he smokes crack. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, drinks rice wine. I think I think we'd all like a little rice wine, Aunt. Maybe if you drank some, 
You I let me go to the mountain. To follow a god. All the yeah. other ki- all the other ants are letting their their nephews, uh, adopted nephews, go to the mountain. Right. Why my, can't my you let friends? Me? My friends aunt uh, let him buy Wolfenstein 3D. Didn't matter that it had blood in it. <laughs> That's another that was another controversial video game from a similar time period. Um, so basically, the rest of the chapter plays out with, "But what about this person? They'll miss you." And he's like, <laughs> right. "What?" And, yeah. and I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> what yeah. about your brother?" And we're like, I, "He hasn't been home in months." And I'm like, "But he'll come back." And then they're like, "And then he'll go home, go on another building project." It's like, right, right. There, there. It's, it's just. It just it basically every loose end had to be tied off before hey, he loose, leaves. Loose ends that we didn't know existed. We didn't know existed and did not have to be, did not have to exist in this, right. in the spirit of editing and brevity. <laughs> right. We just got it. Got, yeah. Just, just everybody, everyone. We just got to make sure that no one will be even halfway upset that you're climbing a mountain because of this vague uh, couplet. You know, that's, that's this all. vague couplet written by Shakespeare. Um, <laughs> So in chapter two, uh, we get a little bit more history about uh, where in China this is taking place. Yeah, this was interesting. So like, the nation he gives, is, gives us he, he does everything. but give us the longitude and latitude. Yeah. So basically it's in central China uh, mm-hmm. in a nation called Chung Kuo. Um, and following the unification under the Qin, China was ruled by the Han Dynasty, for whom Kung Lao had little regard. So he's Kung Lao, not a fan of the Hans. He is not anti f- anti Han anti Han di- Dynasty. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a, it's, yeah. it's an interesting detail. It's a, it will not be coming up. It, again. it will not be coming up again. The political <laughs> leanings. Of Kung Lao, yeah, he was, he are was confined to this paragraph. He was a diehard Democrat back in those days. <laughs> back when the Democrats were racist, right? <laughs> yeah, the old school Democrats. <laughs> Unlike right now, when they're right. Hmm. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you know what this <laughs> just reminded t- me of? We had we just got a one star uh, rating I mean. by somebody who said we talk about politics too much and compared uh, our political discourse to uh the the neoliberal babblings of children from the from chap the chapter two of the book 1984 and uh i am which is where we get all of our ideas which is where we get all of our ideas but i am offended (laughs) i am not neoliberal (laughs) no (laughs) and i and i get a terrible feeling by the way that this person in gen- has not gotten to the bioshock episodes. no no because it, it felt a little because he even said at the end he was like i'm gonna keep listening just in case and i was like oh no he hasn't he hasn't even definitely gotten close hasn't to gotten to yet. the bioshock episodes oh boy so oh boy. anyway kung lao big anti anti honor um, right he is he's walking and we're getting a lot of landmarks <laughs> in <Yeah>. China. <laughs> yeah, he, he, we're, we're setting a lot of, yeah, just like, this is what ancient China was like. I think, you know, and it's nice because it's interesting. I didn't expect, like, a, a, a light tourist's guide to ancient China uh, from this book, uh, but it's, it's it's interesting. It's also a little, I don't know, unnecessary yeah the one the getting one into like really fake in- fantasy world yeah soon, like yeah the one really interesting part of this chapter is when it reveals that the real reason kung lao's dad was obsessed with with the explosives was because he wanted to build a rocket to the moon <laughs> right <laughs> remember how we talked about that whiplash kids here we go again yeah this is by the way by the way i don't want you guys to misunderstand this is not played for laughs this is dead serious this is dead serious it just happens to be hilarious just, that's all <laughs> it it's so the choices are really interesting but yeah it, it it basically gives us a little background on on kung lao and his family and how the the seeker kind of gene has been uh, a strong pass down from that, generation to generation. Right. The, Kung, they, they the Lao family just goes off and dies. 
<laughs> right, right. <laughs> they, they ask a lot of questions of the gods and then they die. That seems to be, it's like Lieutenant Dan in, uh, in Forrest Gump. Just yeah. Someone from their family has died from every single god over the course of, of generations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, in chapter three, Kung Lao is, is now, he's kind of in the vicinity of the mountain. Um, mm. And he's climbing now. He's tired and <laughs> talking to himself. And yes. he, uh, there's, there's just a lot of like description of, you know, catching fish and, and I think at one point he eats a grub. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lone mortal combat edition. It's uh, yeah, it's really, what it is. yeah, it's <laughs> naked and afraid mortal combat. Right. Right. <laughs> It's basically naked and fatality. The first few pages of chapter three. Um, yeah. And things get interesting. Um, eventually, Kung Lao runs into uh, an unnamed character uh, who is, is mysterious, and there's thunderclaps every time he does anything, which are mm-hmm. probably just covering up his farts. Um, I mean, oh, they, I think they are his farts. They friend. are. They probably are his farts. God's uh, fart because like nobody's business. Hey, now. It's Raiden. Uh, Raiden, classic, <laughs> classic. You Raiden. cannot, you cannot have Mortal Kombat without Raiden. That's just all there is to it. So, um, yeah, Kung Lao and Raiden just they have a they have a heart to heart about, um, you know, what it means to really give oneself over to the gods. Mm-hmm. Um, it, they talk a lot about how there's the duality and the duality theme is going to come up a lot. How yeah. Raiden was, uh, he saw Raiden earlier as a beggar and now he's seeing him as a God. And well, and it also heavily implies that because he's seen his dad when his dad was a seeker and he was alive, he would spend time with this kind of cloaked shadowy man in the distance. Like, and he didn't know who he was. And it's heavily implied that Raiden appeared to him. Yeah, uh, in the past and probably generation before, uh, generations before. Uh, so Kung Lao's lineage, uh, Raiden really likes them. Apparently. Yeah, Raiden likes them. He tends to talk them into doing stuff that gets them killed, but he likes them. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And we do get a good. We do get a good line here with him realizing who Raiden is. Raiden says, uh, "Your father was not the chosen one." He said, "You were. You understand." You understood the duality of all things. I did, said Kung Lao, to which I responded, he did? Like, we don't. <laughs> I did. At this point, he's a little, he was a little kid. It's like, you're looking at this little kid and going, yes. Yes. That little six-year-old he's, knows about duality. He's the shit. <laughs> right. Right. And, 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 you know, look, duality is a fascinating uh, uh, topic. But I think most people understand duality in the world. Yeah. They understand paradoxical ideas. Yeah, and, and, but basically, yeah. Uh, Kung Lao was Anakin Skywalker. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, if if we want to if we want to get down to it, um, uh, Raiden was uh, was was what's his name? Qui Gon Jinn. And <laughs> right, <laughs> Kung Lao is Anakin Skywalker. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And then, and so to give him an example of what Raid, it's like Raiden's going, I saw something in you. And he says, That night, the sky was split by a single streak of lightning, which struck and destroyed the tree. And you were afraid. It's like, Okay. Yeah. yeah. So far, so far, that's that yeah. tracks. That, to calm your fears, you began to think about the lightning bolt, and you realized the flash that destroyed also provided light, that there are two sides to everything, darkness, light, fear, courage, life, death, a beggar, God. Like, okay, you know, I will admit, if I met a five-year-old who was thinking about shit like that, I would be impressed. I think I would, I'd be impressed. I'm not sure it would be like, send him on an epic God quest impressed. Yeah. But... <laughs> But it might be like, oh, we're going to put them in the talented and gifted program. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to make sure that he knows his, you know, multiplication tables we're gonna, we're uh, gonna, in elementary school. Yes, yeah, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna move him up a grade because he seems yeah. a little bored um, in in this grade. Yeah, and and you know when they're bored, it gets they out just of hand. get into trouble. 
It's true. They start mixing their explosives. <laughs> <laughs> they try to rocket to the moon. Yeah. <laughs> because they think they can find God that way or something. I don't know. Your dad was kind of a moron. Uh, <laughs> what what we forget to mention is this whole scene is set to fly me to the moon. Um, right. <laughs> Kung Lao is like getting misty eyed. <laughs> Suddenly he hears the background music. He's Fly like, wait, that's not funny. Don't play moon. that. <laughs> Let me play among the stars. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, we get, we move on to chapter four. Uh, new character. Oh, another classic character here. Shang Tsung. Shang Tsung. Yes. Uh, Shang Tsung is basically... He's been researching the hell out of how to get to the netherworld, the outer worlds, whatever mm. you want to call it. He's been reading the Greeks. He's been reading the, the Japanese. He's been reading the Chinese scholars. He's been reading literally every scholar he can find. He's Absolutely. also left his family to do this. Yeah. He just like got up and left one day. Um and the I think the the one who he is kind of leaning on for a lot of his ideas is an Egyptian scribe named Amotep, um, yes. which I believe is one of the names used in the Mummy, uh, starring Brendan Fraser. Oh no, Emotep was was the Emotep. Mummy. Yeah, so Amotep is the Egyptian scribe. Uh, they're they're trying to reach the dead place. Um, so. Shang Tsung has been trying to figure figure this out. Yeah, I highlighted years before he had left his position as a tax collector, feigned yes. his death by killing and disfiguring another man, and changed his name in order to do what his wife's brother, Wing Lao, had done. Experiment, quest, seek knowledge. So, so that makes Shang Tsung Kung Lao's uncle? Uh, uncle by marriage, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. Yep, because Wing Lao is uh, Kung Lao's uh, papa. His right. name was Wing, and he tried to fly Wing. to the moon. <laughs> oh, God, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> oh, for Pete's sake. Oh, boy. Um, but yeah, it, we re recap again that Wing had blown himself up <laughs> in an, a, an experiment. Um. But he was always he was always a little bit jealous of Wing's ability to just like seek knowledge, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, he is he's not a he was not a fan of Kung Lao, uh, or or his or the the kids or the nephews or or what have you. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we get a whole lot of detail about just his research. Um, yeah, it's he he like again, it makes you think like, is this possibly based on actual ideas or anything like that? Yeah, like, it's interesting. They get very specific. And like you said, the philosophers that he's looking into. And I do admire how they did this, because uh, instead, usually when you're setting up a character who's schooled in the dark arts, you have, you know, a vague tome of evil or something like that. But uh, our author here actually makes a point of saying like he studies minerals. He studies animals. He studies yeah, like, everything. He's studying everything. It's not uh, just one like Necronomicon that he right. needs. It's basically he needs. There is no set of instructions. He basically needs to put to put together the instructions himself based on right. what everybody else has figured out across the world. Um, so he sails to this like islands that is just kind of um, it gave me the vibes of it's like the the intersection point of ley lines that which is like mm -hmm. that supernatural thought of like these the like a point of like power like supernatural power. So he goes to this island to do this ceremony that he picked up from the god uh, not the god the scribe Amotep and he begins to recite the words. Um, and suddenly there's there's just this this wall of fire around him mm -hmm. uh, and it encases him and he is somewhere else now. Yeah. Yeah. 
he basically takes over uh, this little island for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's uh, again, it's it's this level of detail that, like, uh, yeah, it... Oh, hold on, hold on. I'm looking at something that I almost forgot. It's just a detail, but it cracked me the fuck up. He's looking at, he's looking at all kinds of stuff. The air was damp and cold at times. A trick of fog-diffused sunlight. Uh, and then it says, rocks and cliffs that seemed lumpy and jagged from afar were smooth up close. And they're trying to set this world up that he has found himself in as like strange and geometry doesn't work the right ways. It's yeah. stuff that, you know, you see in a lot of fans stuff. But the first thing I thought was like, oh, sure, it's an old video game. The rendering was shitty. <laughs> the draw distance was all <laughs> fucked right, up. Right. It was all fucked up. <laughs> and so, I was yeah. like uh, in the back of my head, I'm like, this place is strange and unusual. And then the Lydia Dietz line of. I too right. am strange and unusual. <laughs> That's exactly it. <laughs> it's exactly it. Yeah, he's he's found himself in this place where he can, you know, get into some trouble. Like he can get, sorcerers are he can, he can he can fuck about, you know? Indeed. He can indeed he can cast to? some spells. Uh meanwhile. Meanwhile, uh, in the outer, I forget what they're called in, in Mortal Kombat. It's like the outer realm or outer world yeah, or something, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we get a, a conversation between a demon and a demon king. Um, Shao Kahn. Shao Kahn, the, the big baddie. The It's like Shang Tsung is like the, he's like, it's like. Running a D and D campaign and having a big bad evil guy like sh and at Shang Tsung, and then you kill him and you realize, oh, there's an even bigger bad e evil guy. Right, that's Shao Kahn. <laughs> yeah, if if you guys saw the first Mortal Kombat movie, and I know you did, uh, at the very very end after they defeated Shang Tsung and everything like that, and there's the crazy guy with the skull helmet in the clouds shouting at them about taking their souls and stuff and they go i don't think so and they strike a pose and the credits roll and that inescapable <laughs> fucking techno song starts playing uh that that guy Mortal in the clouds that, that, <laughs> that dude that's shao Kahn. that's the guy that's shao Kahn. uh and for the record it is unavoidable uh you will be hearing that song in your head the entire time you're reading this book fun fact in uh, the sequel uh, Shao Kahn comes down. Johnny Cage uh, does a does a jump kick at him, and Shao Kahn catches him and breaks his neck. Just breaks his <laughs> fucking neck. That's a picture wrap on like, Johnny Cage. <laughs> yeah, like less than five minutes in. <laughs> that movie was a piece of shit. Like that's I think that's movie. why. I think that's why we remember. It. You ask people like, what do you think is like a really good uh, uh, video game movie? And most people will go. You know, Mortal Kombat's a lot of fun. Like, that was a good one. And here's the thing. It is a lot of fun. It's a terrible movie. Uh, so bad. It is. Oh, so bad. And Mortal Kombat 2, we, just oh, garbage pile. Mortal Kombat, is, I think Armageddon, Mortal Kombat Armageddon, it is. I forget. <laughs> even for a video game movie. Now, here's the thing. Mortal Kombat 2, the movie, was the movie that, when you're a little kid, and this is a little tangent, but it's totally re related. I swear to God. Yeah. Uh, when you're a kid, most movies are good. Most movies are good. Yeah. Like you, just, you might get you're like, that's great. I love it. Yeah. 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 You might or, or even you might go, eh, it's boring. It's a boring movie. Right. But you don't say that is a shitty movie. It's badly made. It's badly performed. It's badly edited, etc. You just go, oh, I don't want to watch that movie. It's a boring movie. Right. Um. That was the first I saw it in the theaters when I was in middle school, I want to say, uh, whenever it came out. Yeah. And that might have been one of the earliest movies that I watched and went, oh, that is a bad movie. Right. Like, that is not just a, like and, and for the record, that was the same theater that I saw Anaconda three times. You watch summer Anaconda three times. Yeah. I paid money to see Anaconda three times in the movie theater that summer. Uh, uh, it, it, I don't know if it was the same summer as when Mortal Kombat 2 came out, but it was the same theater, and I happily did it. And Anaconda is a stinking piece of shit. Yeah. And I still went, yep, that was pretty great. I'm going to watch that again. I'm going to totally watch Ice Cube call a giant snake a bitch one more time. That's going to be great. And uh, But I walked out of the theater uh, for Mortal Kombat Armageddon uh, just going, that was 
that was horribly made. Who greenlit that? So, so they. Um, what's amazing is in between uh, the first and the second movie, they recast Raiden. Raiden. Yeah, whatever. yeah. So the first movie is what am I? Oh my. Uh, He's a guy that I question why he ever had a career. Uh, oh, yes. He goes by the name of Christopher Lambert. Uh, I have, there is, you know what? Go to the guest section of the website and look up. Um, there is an appearance that I had on another person's podcast talking about Highlander. I think I have it in there. Mm-hmm. Just, just listen to that instead because it's basically <laughs> two hours of me talking about uh christopher lambert's uh mush mouth accent um that is just it's just ugh. but they it, recast it, him as, with james remar who james it, remar who was a it like by so such a better actor than christopher right, lambert but, but also possibly one of the most missed cast actors i've ever seen like of course he was almost hicks uh, for Christ's sake. Yeah. So who knows? Who do, I, who knows what's right? I'm just saying sex in the city's own uh, was was playing the God of thunder and lightning. So why not? What, what the fuck do I know? I don't know. James man. Remar from uh, Dexter, too. Right. He was in Dexter. Right. He was. He, he was played Dexter's the, dad. He played yeah. Dexter's dad. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been interrupted by an impish child. Impish being the perfect word for it. She possibly found the smallest crack available. Like you take a door, you open it up a fraction of an inch, maybe even half a millimeter. Uh, I think she did even less than that with her tiny little elfin hands to strike up a bargain with her father. I don't think it's going to go well. I think... I think she's just pushing, man. Yeah, James Remar. Let's see. Yeah, all right. So for those of you at home who didn't know this, all right, so James Remar, yeah, he played Raiden in the second uh, second Mortal Kombat movie. He was in Django Unchained. Chained. He was in Sex and the City for a while. was kind of a prominent guy in that. Uh, was the dad in the de- and, uh, Dexter. He was in The Warriors. Like, this, this dude's had a really crazy career and if you look him up you will know him from something i guarantee it that dude was nearly hicks uh from aliens like he actually i think they cast like i I, well they cast him and i think they filmed like a shit ton of it with him in it and uh your experience with him and whether or not based on where you've seen him in the past is going to color your opinion of whether or not he could possibly have been Hicks in Aliens, for God's sake. Uh, the fact of the matter was, is that one of the earliest things I ever saw him in was Sex in the City. Uh, so the idea of him playing Hicks seems insane to me. Apparently, he had, uh, I think he had a bit of a drug problem. And uh, they said, we cannot put up with that shit. Uh, but check it out. Like, look it up. There's pictures of him on the set as Hicks. It's kind of crazy if you're used to the cast that I am. Okay, just giving, just giving the people a quick history lesson on uh, James Remar, uh, who almost played Hicks in Aliens. Oh, yeah, that would have been weird casting. That's see, that's what I was saying. I said your 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 <laughs> belief as to whether or not he could have played Hicks is going to be colored entirely based on what you first saw him in yeah consciously right and actually one of the earliest things i ever saw him in was sex of the city so it just wasn't going to work right right just was that was never going to work um, yeah, i think he had a drug problem they, they kicked him out oh really yeah yeah well i mean it's good that he though that he's he's managed to to maintain a really solid career i mean he tends to just oh, like he's, he's everywhere man he's everywhere he doesn't and, just guest appear in tv shows by the way yeah he is like in them for oh, yeah. he's either a recurring character or whatever. He's a, he's a good actor. He's a quintessential and, uh, that guy. Like it, very much so. He is an he's an he is a that guy gold star. <laughs> uh, he uh, if you want something real fun and kind of sad, uh, watch the uh, the 
what's the series on Netflix about like, is it the movies that made us? Mm. Um, they do one on aliens and they interview him and he talks about it and he's really humble and very, and very charming about the whole thing. But you can tell like there's a serious sense of regret, like not, he would have not being able to be an alien. Oh, yeah. absolutely. He regrets it. So it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's worth a look. Meanwhile, so we're, we're in hell. We're in hell. Uh, <laughs> uh, Chao Kahn is uh, the Lord of the Outworld, Master outworld, of the right. Furies, King of the Dark Arts, Breaker of Chains, Mother of Dragons. Um, and he got an MBA from DeVry. And he has a he has a MBA from DeVry University. <laughs> um, is talking to a little fat demon called Ruthe. Um, I like Ruthe. I wish they'd give us more Ruth A. I, I, more I feel Ruth like a. there was every there was a it feels uh, 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 yeah yeah uh, yeah potential yeah here. yeah energy real yeah yeah energy with Ruth A. Yeah, um, they really uh, I, I want to say Jeff really shortchanged us on that. Uh. <laughs> I think so. That's that's where I got frustrated. Really, uh, that was the first time I was like, I don't know, man. I don't know. It was kind of bullshit. Um, so Ruth A. is reporting to uh shao khan that ah there's another human who found himself in the outworld but uh oh we think this one actually might be the one that you're looking for so shao khan has been waiting for a human to show up and uh lo and behold it is (laughs) yeah yeah He, he makes it clear that that uh and yeah, he and so we get this interesting dialogue back and forth between Shang Tsung and Shao Kahn. And basically the gist of it is that different embodiments of Shang Tsung, generations of him, versions of him have come to Shao Kahn over and over and over again to basically serve him uh, in a mission to open a portal between the outworld and earth right yeah so he so that shao khan can send his army of fat little demon babies his, uh, his assume, little army of ruthes uh, yeah his army of ruthes through and by the end of their conversation shang Tsung remembers and they've got a plan where basically shang Tsung has to collect souls because a soul is a piece of pan ku the uh the god the god who and created everything well Exactly. Whose death started the process of everything being created. Right, right. And so Shao Kahn says, I'm going to send you back with Ruth A here, and you're going to start collecting souls for me. Yeah. And the more souls we get, the bigger the portal will get, and eventually we'll get a portal. Uh, the, the, Good the enough for the, ar- will... for the armies to, to exactly. basically. Exactly. Because uh, Shao, Kahn's, Shao Kahn's idea is that the intention of Panku, uh, Panku never intended for there to be an outworld and a a for there to be multiple realms. There's only ever right. supposed to be one realm, and that's pretty bold of Shao Kahn to like really talk about the intentions of uh, of Panku, who doesn't exist anymore. And right. uh, as we learn later, that I believe. We learn later that Raiden is the only one who knows what Pan Ku's intentions ever would have been because yeah, he, there's yeah. like a brief mention that Raiden inherited the memories of Pan Ku. So not even Tien, uh, who was the the god that basically started the whole process of using Pan Ku's uh, body parts. Um, right. Not even Tien really knew had the memories of Pan Ku. Only Raiden does. Right, um, which explains why Raiden is kind of chumming up with the human side of things because correct. he knows how fucked up this could get. He knows he knows shits shit can get really real, right? Quick, right. right. And one last thing: any of the souls that they use to open the portal wider and wider, they have to be souls that Shang Tsung has won that he has taken. Yes. Uh, otherwise. It, it comes out of his ass, literally, like pieces of him his, are going to be. Going yeah, he has it. to use his soul to keep the portal living. Right. Um, so we jump over to chapter six and, and Kung Lao has basically he this is years later. Um, Kung yes. Lao has is a, a warrior priest 
um, and and all that stuff. He uh, and oh, here's here it is on like on the next uh, on the second page of this chapter. Um, he Kung Lao says he learned that alone among the gods, Raiden carried the memory uh, the memory of the parent god. Even mm-hmm. Tien did not have the knowledge that Raiden did. So yeah, there so, you go. Raiden's pretty important. It's pretty important. And and Raiden's been passing on that same knowledge to Kung Lao. And so. Raiden is all about yes, there must be duality. And Shao yes. Kahn is like no duality, only oneness. Everything right. needs to be the same thing. So there you go. Yeah, now, Raiden is part of a very uh, uh, unique sect on the internet uh, called Both Sides Are Good. Actually. <laughs> Raiden is the guy who shows up on your on your tweets. Um, he's actually the drill tweet. Um, right. No, no, no. Yeah, he is no, the no. Drill. He's he is the uh, or is Shao Kahn the drill tweet? Um, who is the drill? One of them is the drill tweet where it says <laughs> there's no difference between either side. You buffoon. You would eat or something right. like that. Yeah, that's see. Oh, that's right. I guess it's Raiden because. <laughs> I think it's Raiden. Yeah, let's say Raiden is that drill tweet. Um, Raiden's the guy who pops up in your replies that you're you say you're not wrong, you're just an asshole. Yes. <laughs> both sides. He's he's talking about both sides all the time. Um yes. he wants more context whenever he sees a story right. about the police misusing when you their say power. That, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Uh, we find out that Kung Lao is now wearing a smooth white orb amulet around his neck. Don't get used to uh, it. He's getting rid of it. Yep. Yeah, yeah. He's he's getting rid of it. We basically get the idea that he has been studying up here in the mountains. He has been fighting uh, a lot. He's he's. We've jumped ahead a lot. Uh, you know, years at this point, and we were kind it's of been talking about, about thirteen that years. Yeah. 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 And he has been fighting in a tournament called Mortal Kombat for all of those years, and he has won it every every year. year. Yes. And the reward, the final test is always against Shang Tsung, and the reward is uh, immortal life. So even though he has gone forward uh, for uh, 13, 14 years, he has not aged. He's still he's still as young as he ever was. Right. So, uh, but this time around, he's, and he's, he's always had, well, he has two things working for him. He's got the fact yeah. that he's winning, but he also has this amulet, which mm-hmm. also makes him immortal. He's got double yes. immortality, basically double immortality. <laughs> and he's, uh, he's not, uh, he's not interested in using that amulet anymore. No. Um, I- why, why does he get rid of the amulet. I missed okay, that. I don't know. I, I It's not it's not it's super not, clear. He just basically says, "I'm not going to use it anymore." Yeah. Yeah. It, it's I don't uh, even know yeah. why it was introduced to be honest. <laughs> I don't know either. It's this thing that it's kind of like a fail safe for him. Yeah. Um the power even if of he the lost gods, the amulet would prevent him from dying. I think I think the gist of it is is he hear he has heard through I don't know what kind of a grapevine does living on a mountain by yourself with a thunder god have right uh but he heard through something that there's a new competitor in this year's Mortal Kombat and there's a pretty good chance that he will lose and I think he's worried about the amulet getting into the wrong hands sure but uh but yeah that wasn't that's super tough, that though, was not that's... super cleared um, no, no, I did like this this I, concept that's brought up. He wished he could return the amulet to Raiden, but he knew that wasn't possible. What a god has given to mortals can never be returned, for it is no longer deistic. Even to touch it would make the god no longer a god, but a mortal. And I was like, that's I actually like that too. that's actually a really cool concept. Like, yeah, yeah, I I liked that too. That was that was really. That was again. This guy's building this mythology, and it's pretty kick ass. Yeah, like, it's a kick it's, ass. It's a kick ass. It's, it's a it's a bitch and van art mythology. But it really <laughs> is. It really it's a fucking heavy metal album <laughs> epic. Uh, and and in in which makes sense when you think about it because 
what what do heavy metal nerds love? They love their blood and guts. And this is they all love their crazy. This mythology. is a mythology that Frank Farzetta would would <laughs> would be right at home painting. He would have been thrilled. He would have he would have illustrated the fuck out of this. Um, so uh, Kung Lao breaks up some rocks uh, with his fists and then buries the amulet and goes He's just showing off at that point. goes off for his week long journey to Mount Takashi, which is where the place yes. is going to be. Um, so he arrives in chapter seven. Uh, he basically arrives and we get some lowdown on all of the like the sights and sounds of of this weird little temple out here yeah. in Shimura Island, which is I guess I didn't put it together just now. Shimura Island is the islands earlier that uh, Shang Tsung had basically used to um, he that's where he started the whole thing. It's his home base. It's his home yeah. base. Yeah. Yeah, he's been he's been renovating the place. He's been renovating. Yeah, there's an old like Shaolin temple ruins that he's trying to like you know fixer upper kind of thing. So up the resale value. Yeah, he's he's up the resale value. He's he, it, but it's not a love it or list it situation. He's really no, no. he's really got to learn to love it. Um, so yeah, Raiden no Raiden had warned Kung Lao before leaving an image of Tian will be present on Takashi and not as a friend. Now, if yeah. you remember earlier in the book, they described in the prologue, there's a description of what Tian looks like. And uh, he's basically, he's got a bunch of arms and mm -hmm. he's a beefcake. And um, I guess that kind of spoils what <laughs> what's going oh, to be yeah. coming up soon. Um, yeah, we all know where that's we going. We know where that's going. But um, so... He was like, so Kung Lao was like, ah, that I've only ever seen multi-limbed creatures. Tian, Tian depicted as a multi-limbed creature. So I wonder what's going on anyway. Yeah, and, and we know, and we both know that can't be right. So I'm sure it means something else. Tumpty dumpty dum. Yes. Um, so one <laughs> of the things that, that um, they, he, he talks about Kung Lao is noticing is every time he comes back, Shang Tsung, is older and older yeah. and older. Um, and we learn a little bit more about that, about the why of that later. Um, but yeah, uh, Kung Lao also, is this, is this, um, I, was, I was thinking of, of what is he, is he doing the, the thing? What? Oh, I was, I was, <laughs> There's a there's a moment later where Kung Lao basically starts flagellating himself. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We get a little bit. He he basically start. Yeah. He starts hitting himself. OK, no, with, it didn't happen. It's not in this chapter. Uh, right, and this, yeah, this, that, this that chapter, this chapter basically just continues on as as a pretty detailed description of the temple and and, yes, and the people yes. living at the temple and, and all all that stuff. So that's chapter seven. Um, yeah, that's we'll get to the flashlight. He's, he's got a bad feeling. He's got a bad vibe. He's basically. getting getting bad vibes about that. We'll yeah. get to the flagellating. That happens soon. Trust me. <laughs> Trust me. We're, we're, we're not going to. We're skip not going to skip that scene. Um, uh, so chapter eight, we get Shang Tsung, and we get a little bit more uh, detail as to why is he so so old now. Um, basically, yes. in chapter eight, he has he has a hidden room in the temple, and Ruth A is is in this room as like an anchor for the portal to the outworld. And Ruth A has gone insane because he has yes. not been allowed to move for 13 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And here's the thing. It's kind of implied that it's like it's a it's it's a stretch of his mind for being so far away from where he's from, from the the realm that he's from. Yeah. But honestly, you can just read it as he hasn't been able to move from one spot for 13 years. I think we'd all be ready to snap. Yeah. Yeah. Mortal realm or no. Mortal realm or not, I think we would have some uh we would have some issues. Uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, so basically, uh, Shang Tsung, it, it, this chapter details Shang Tsung's initial 
efforts when he gets back yeah. from the outworld. First, he's like, well, I'll just kill some travelers and throw them their souls into the portal. I'm like, well, that didn't really do anything. Um, right. Oops. <laughs> so he gradually works his way up on, on who he's killing to, to try their souls out. Um, and basically, it's it's only going to be great warriors, the soul of a great warrior that really helps him open the portal up. Um, yeah. So uh, that's when he comes up with the idea for Mortal Kombat. Um, That's right. So he 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 sends out a dream to warriors from across the land to come out, come to come here, come to this island and face off in a great fighting tournament. And uh, he kills a bunch of uh, I want to say this is where he kills a bunch of pirates. And yeah. and then he he takes then, their souls. Then he kills out. a bunch of chefs. <laughs> yeah, basically, he 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 kills a bunch of people that are like that could be like workers and they build this temple and they like, so they don't, they're just dressed in all black. And, and in the previous chapter, Kung Lao was talking about how it's like, Oh yeah, there's these weird dudes that are always just wearing black and you can never see their face and be like, yeah, that's because they're corpses that are just walking around. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Shang Tsung gets his necromancer on, uh, and basically has this small army of undead servants that are rebuilding everything that kind of wait on him. And, you know, because he can't do it all alone. No, he, he needs some rotting corpses to some, help get things along. Some fresh, some, some ghouls. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then the chapter kind of breaks down. Like there's a full beat by beat breakdown of the first fight that Shang Tsung and Kung Lao had ever had at the, it's yeah. at the end of the first Mortal Kombat tournament. Um, that it, it's just like, here's, here's what's happened. Shang, Shang Tsung was, should have won. He's like, he really regrets it. He like, he basically relives it every day because he's like, yeah, yeah. I should have won that first one. I should have won that. <laughs> <laughs> it's eating him up and it's been eating him up inside for 13 for fucking 13 years. years. He's been really bitter, yeah. bitter about it. Um, and uh, so basically uh, he, he realizes that he should have won that one. Um, and he calls Kung Lao. Um, he's really bitter about Kung Lao. And he calls yes. him a little goldfish who enjoyed swimming in the pool of his own piety. He's like, right. he's like, he's like Kung Lao is this holier than thou piece of shit, basically. Yeah. <laughs> he, 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 Shang Tsung is Homer Simpson and Kung Lao is Ned Flanders. That's what it yes. is as far as he's concerned. Yeah. He, and, and, but, and, and despite all of that, he knows that Kung Lao has this magical amulet given to him by Raiden that gives him extra power and stuff, but he still says it's more than just the amulet. It's not just the amulet that's right. causing him to kick my ass. Yeah. Because not only did Kung Lao beat him on the first tournament, he's beat him every single every time. Every single year since. Yeah. Um, and Shang Tsung is losing more and more of his power. He's aging and at a... Uh, incredibly accelerated pace yes because he has to take out a piece of his own soul and feed it to the portal in order to keep the portal open every year exactly every year that he doesn't do it and they give us a little breakdown of um basically if if the uh if ruth a were to fully cross over um it would obliterate basically all of the it would like destroy the universe or something like that. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, also, it's, also the, yeah, just, just, just that little thing there. There's also this, this great little description while he was here trapped atop the circle, Ruth, a was still rooted in the outworld. but if the doorway were shut, he would be nothing more than an unctuous smear. Only if right. a God were to cross from one realm to the, to a, the other redefine the nature of the life and matter there. Could the two worlds be mixed? Yes. <laughs> so, a lot riding on There's this. There's a lot riding on this. Yeah. And uh, and Shang Tsung's feeling the pressure, too. So, this year, he knew he needed uh, a bit of an ace. He needs a ringer. Sleeve. He really needs a yes. ringer here. 
That's exactly what he needs. Um, because uh, he's promising Shao Kahn this this is the year, and Shao Kahn this is, is like, the one. it better be the year, or else I'm going to take yeah, what remains. Right, he it says, "I'm going to take what remains of your soul, and I am going to put it as a boil on my dragon's tongue." <laughs> Right. That is that Kevin's not. Yeah. And Kevin's not like making anything up. That is literally that what is he literally says. what Shao Kahn threads him with. So Shang yeah. Tsung stakes are high. Yeah, they're up. There. They're up there. Um, so, OK, chapter nine. Kung Lao has a ritual. <laughs> yeah. Kung Lao has a ritual where he basically um, takes a thorn branch and he he drags it over every inch of his body. So he's just like crisscrossed with like just bloody cuts. Yeah. All and they're, over. They're, yeah. And it, and it says here, it says the thin superficial wounds did not weaken him, but Kung Lao knew that if his flesh were sore, he would react that much quicker to protect himself from being hurt. I feel like that's not how it works. But then again, Anyone who's been threatened uh, with a fly swatter when they have a, a sunburn, uh, yeah, maybe maybe it would work. Maybe actually. it would work. I don't know. <laughs> maybe he it also would talks work. about how he like would refuse to eat because the hunger would really yeah. focus him. Like I've never note thought that hunger made me more focused. Usually, it just made me a little bit uh, my brain less worky. <laughs> now, if he said, if he said. Uh, he, he stopped eating so that he'd be extra irritable and take his rage out on his enemies. Now, that's something I get. I would I would be I would believe that 100 percent. He's like, I Absolutely. stopped eating. So I'm hangry during the fights and be like, now, yeah, there we go. that would be like, oh, no, we're not fucking with this guy. No, we're not fucking Just with not. this guy at all. Um, nope. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, nope. So that's that's chapter nine. Super duper short. Chapter 10. Mm. Uh, we get a description, more description of the courtyard uh, of the palace. And there's a really cool description of Shang Tsung's throne, which is I was hoping you were going to bring up the throne, which is bad guy throne 101. The chair yep. was made of made of iron forged in the shape of human bones, cushioned with mystically preserved blubber of a whale and covered with a thick throw of fur from one of the sacred pandas. Fur only one such as Shang would dare to take. <laughs> I love a, the panda detail. The panda detail <laughs> is amazing. A canopy amazing. of unknown material supported by a column of constructed of shark teeth protected oh, him from that, the hazy yeah. sun. Some said the material was human flesh, but few thought that even sh uh, the vicious Shang could be capable of such a vile and corrupt display. Kung Lao was not one of the few. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just fucking so over the top. It's so over the like, top. It's wonderful. <laughs> also, something that I guess is never really touched on does Shang does does Shang Tsung ever like mention that Kung Lao is his nephew by marriage? No. Or has Kung Lao not ever yet. recognized Shang Tsung? No. No. Not to my knowledge. Uh, there's no and and let's face facts. They would have taken that opportunity for one of them to chew the hell out of the scenery. Sure. Uh, with something like that. So I think that's not I don't I don't know if that's happening with this particular uh, uh, section of the book. No, let's just say. no, because we're coming to an end. Um, yes. Uh, to the uh, of this section of the book, because um, we've we're we've already uh, pretty much we're we're towards the end of the of the tournament already. Yes. Um, we get some yes. some quick descriptions of of uh, a couple of the fights the final rounds yeah we some some basic fights some basic stuff. fights uh kung lao defeats a, a a guy named ophila the ostrogoth um mm -hmm. we get some we get some nice german representation here well just a little just who a used little a, who not? doesn't know martial arts he just uses a spiked club <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, we're not gonna get a lot of crane kicks from this guy no, no. Um, and then uh, Mahara, a uh, Marian who recites the Ve Vedic hymn of creation. So Indian, that's a, which is 
uh in from india i believe right the vedas are yeah 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 um but basically once he lost his teeth he had trouble because he was he used this hymn of creation to focus his himself while he was fighting but then he gets a few teeth knocked out and yeah. basically the fight uh falls apart there and then there's a roman wrestler uh named toysaurus uh who nearly beats kung lao um but they circle back the self-inflicted lacerations are what give kung lao the focus to break the uh the pin so See, no it's, point it's a good strategy <laughs> no point for toy cyrus um <laughs> on the pin um so basically they 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 kind of fast through it forward through all the fights. Kung Lao is victorious yeah. and he is the champion again. And we have a back and forth between Shang Tsung and Kung Lao debating the yeah. merits of religion and magic and all that fun shit. Yeah. Yeah. The, the classic line, religion is not magic. Kung Lao said a debatable point for some other time. <laughs> Shang it's like, all right. All right. <laughs> all right. That's that's fine. Um, so. <laughs> um, so basically, they they have their little their little back and forth, their little war with words. And and so here's the thing is that Kung Lao, um, he has defeated everybody um, mm-hmm. in order to get the the title of the champion. He has to defeat the host, which is. I believe at this point, an optional fight, like the only way right. to, to be champion and not age for the next year is if he beats the host, he can back out now and it, everything is fine. And, and Kung Lao is like, nah, I gotta, I'm, I'm, I, why would I back away? I'm the champion. <laughs> you know, for a guy who was nervous about this fight and everything because of not wearing his amulet, he's, he's, he makes some dumb calls, let's just yeah. say. So Shang Tsung is like, oh, by the way, I'm not the one fighting. I've, I've, according to the rules of Mortal Kombat, I can name <laughs> somebody else. The rules that I made up, because it's my tournament. Because yeah. like, it's my tournament, damn it. Because it's my tournament, god damn it. Um, so he, has, he lets uh, uh, somebody fight on his behalf, and all this time... There's just been thundering footsteps coming in off the distance. Um, and Kung Lao is like, this is a sinister presence, all that, all that <laughs> stuff. Um, and who could it be? Oh, no, it's Goro. 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 Who would have thunk it, right? Who would have thought the <laughs> claymation monster himself from... <laughs> I think he's claymation in the first Mortal Kombat. <laughs> something it's like it's definitely a practical effect it's definitely a practical effect um (laughs) so uh so basically it's it's gonna be a fight against goro and this fight basically is um it's it's that it's that fight from game of thrones it's the mountain oh yeah versus um uh the mandalorian um what's his name um yeah yeah (laughs) Uh, Pedro Pascal's character. Pedro Pascal, yeah. Um, <laughs> where the <laughs> only way he's going to win is if he's like, if he's basically going to be super fast and and fight and uh, try to avoid this uh, this big beefy boy. Um, right. Right. And chapter, uh, chapter 11 is, it's basically just the entire fight. Yeah, it's 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 the whole fight. It it goes back and forth. In fact, at first, it looks like Kung Lao is pressing the advantage. He's doing pretty good to start with. To start to with. start with. But the fact that Goro has extra arms really comes into play. A lot. It's I, you know, it's not just for show. It really it really are practical. <laughs> practical application. Uh, it turns out. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's uh, we do get one little detail here, which is uh, confusing to me. Uh, I have heard Goro referred to as part dragon, uh, but in the description here, it says as much dragon in appearance as human when describing Goro. And and 
I can, if you tell me, like, dragons have a fascinating mythology. There's all kinds of shit with that. Yeah. And if you tell me that he's part dragon, fine, sure, good. But referring to Goro as, as equally dragon yeah, in appearance as human. Just a confusing I'm, I'm, mental image. Like, like, real quick, if you could describe a dragon to me, just let, just for fun. Let's just, get on the I same page know. as to what kind of dragon we're talking about. Right. There are it's, a bajillion types of dragon out there. Right. Just saying dra he's dragon in appearance, not helping me. <laughs> not helping. Not helping. Especially something saying China. To... It's like, right. Because, right. because, like, Chinese mythology dragons, they have their own thing going. <laughs> They have a pretty distinct look. Yeah. So, I don't know, uh, Jeff, if I if I buy that. Um, but yeah, that one I'm not so sure. Regardless, <laughs> uh, uh, Goro wins. He he wins. I mean, it seems like he wins. It seems like uh, Kung Lao is 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 might have some chance, but that is really each time uh, Kung Lao presses a, his advantage. Goro is able to counter by like catching him. He like sprains Kung Lao's knees or or his ankles. He hurts his shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, he throws him into a wall. Basically, uh, he is not doing any damage to Goro, and Kung Lao is no. just getting beat worse and worse. And eventually, Goro just throws him into the wall and just pummels him can, like just over and over and over again. Absolutely. And finally. Finally, um, uh, Shang Tsung just tells Goro, give me his heart. And mm -hmm. the last thing that Kung Lao sees is uh, two, two arms holding him by his shoulders and a third hand just coming for his chest. Yeah. And I can't help but think that that uh, that's a wrap. On Kung Lao that is here. a wrap on Kung Lao. That is a wrap on this Kung Lao. Yeah. Be and I know you're confused, ladies and gentlemen, because you're like, he didn't even get to throw his his, his razor his, hat. His razor hat. His uh, sharp sombrero. His sharp sombrero. Uh, the, not, the, fear not. The slicey sombrero. Fear not. Yeah. This is just the first Kung Lao. The Kung uh, Lao we all know and love. Not this guy. <laughs> Not this guy. Not this particular guy. Not this particular guy, because uh, meanwhile, 600 meanwhile. miles away, we get um, Kung Lao's uh, brother, right? Or cousin, yeah. whatever. Uh, I think it's his brother. Um, it's his brother. Is, yeah. is, his brother is having a kid, and uh, wouldn't you know it, they do the whole luck of the Fryrish Futurama episode. <laughs> right. That's exactly what they do. <laughs> they named the boy uh, Kung Lao. Um, so basically, it, there's like a sudden premonition from his brother that he needs to name the kid Kung Lao. And he yeah. does so. So um, maybe. And, and meanwhile, Raiden is somewhere else. And we're like, well, maybe it's this next one that is actually yeah, yeah. Raiden's like, oh, I seem to have fucked up with that last prediction. This one, though, and you can't help but think that this has happened a lot in his life. You can't help but think that Raiden has just been for for millennia fucking things up with this, right. with this family like, oh, tree. God. <laughs> I'm a terrible god. This is so stupid. Okay. Uh, I'm a god and you're the chosen one. Honest. Honest. Oh, you want to go to the though. moon? We'll use those yeah. rocks there. Oh, right. shit. <laughs> shit. Um, <laughs> anyway. So, and that's the end of part, part one. That is. Part one. Yeah. That is the first third of the book. Huh. <laughs> what you, what, what, that was a very pregnant that pause, a, Phil. There was a, there was an awful. Here's the thing. It's an awful long first third of the book on like a very specific moment in Mortal Kombat. Like I feel like if this were the TV version or not TV version, but the the film version, this whole thing would have taken about fifteen minutes. Yeah. This. Yeah, I agree. Yes. Now that doesn't make it bad. That doesn't, that make, doesn't it bad. make it bad. It does not make no. it bad. But 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 I'm just 
very I don't know where they're going with this. Yeah. Yet. I mean, it's it's um I've already looked at the first sentence of the next chapter, and I know it's in the next section. Same. We're present day, and it starts right out with Kano, um, who is yes. a, so, a fan favorite villain. Um, uh, he's, he's easily one of my favorites. So <laughs> good. I mean, we we got you know More. maybe maybe something good here. Maybe something good here. But yeah, I agree. I feel like this is a lot of um, this is a lot of prologue for the the real meat of the story yes it is a lot for for yeah exactly as you said and it, it's a lot the other thing is it's weird that we spend so much time on on kung lao um i guess maybe kung lao the, kung lao of all characters who who is okay fine he is one of the main characters starting it from mortal kombat 2 going forward but it's yes. like it's Kung Lao. It's not Liu Kang. Liu Kang is like right. the I would the have expected dude, this to be you know? Liu Kang. Yeah. <laughs> so he has kind of very consistently been our protagonist yeah. uh, in this series for a very long for time. For as little as I know about Mortal Kombat, when I think of the guy, I think of Liu Kang. Yeah. He is he, Same he is your Ryu an analog from Street Fighter. He is he's your dude, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's I, it's I, I don't interesting to not hear from him at, at all. Zero percent. And I, I understand None. establishing it okay, so Kung Lao Kung the first Kung Lao is very in like involved in the backstory of Shao Kahn yes, and Shang yes. Sung. I think okay, I, I can agree to that. But it feels weird that it, you know what it is? I think if it, was, if it was a TV series, and I know this is a book and all that fun stuff, yeah, whatever. Of but if it was a TV series, this would not be told right all up front. This would be something that would no. be pieced out over time. Yes, absolutely. And we were just talking absolutely. about, uh, you know, before we started recording, we were talking about the Godfather series. And one mm-hmm. of the great things that the Godfather series does is that you don't actually get anything about um about once uh uh corleone uh what's his name uh the godfather um vito vito until part two and it's these interspersed Mm -hmm. scenes in which you got robert de niro playing like young vito um yeah and you that's when you get all the information about him like oh what like why does he have that raspy voice and and all that that stuff um so yeah it in a, in any other media, this information would not have just been <laughs> right. Right. It's it's an interesting. It's a very uh, it's a bold yeah, choice. Cotton. Very, Let's see how it pays off. <laughs> right. 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 And that's the thing. It's like I'm not saying this won't work. I'm just saying it's a bold choice. Yeah. And I feel like we yeah. haven't actually started this the book yet. Right, exactly. And the fact is, we are a third of the way through the book. Uh, if this was a much longer book, like twice as long as this, then I would go, okay, all right, that makes that sense, makes sense. For, for an opening kind of but that was know, the, act that was one the, yeah. sort of situation. Yeah, but that was one third of the book we just covered right now. Yeah, that was that was a lot of the book. And so it's really interesting. Now, having said all that, this book has no business being this well written. That was, that was the other thing I was going to get to. It's like, yeah, like this is a fucking Mortal Kombat book. This is for, for all of our bitching about all, that aspect of the book, the, about the story structure. Right. He didn't have to come so hard for Mortal Kombat. He came like, so hard. <laughs> so hard. I feel like I feel like the I, I just imagine being like an editor working for this publisher. Like we have, we've acquired the rights to mortal Kombat. We can sell a million of these books to 10 to 16 year old boys all over the United States. Let's, let's, let's crank something out 200 and some odd pages, make it fast, make it, you know, action packed and, you know, a little gory 
and let's just fucking just do boom, boom, boom. Let's do it. And they called this guy up and they said, here you go. Could you make it happen? And he was like, yeah, here's your uh, here's your first draft. And they're like, what the we we can't pay you more than we offered. And he was like, it's fine. I didn't I didn't do it for you. Yeah, <laughs> this is for me. This is for this me. This is for Bat Boy. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want you to work Bat Boy into the next Mortal Kombat game. Um, They're like, um, uh, we'll get back to you. That I wouldn't be we'll surprised though. That. I wouldn't be surprised though if this guy worked and talked directly with like Ed Boon. Um, yeah, because I feel like Ed Boon and uh, who's the other guy, um, John Tobias, um, are like very into because they've been with Mortal Kombat. I want to say the entire time. I don't think they've left the series. I think Ed Boon is still working on it. I think he's still the. I'm gonna, he might be the producer on it still. Let's 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 uh, check that. Is Ed Boon? Uh, let's see. It looks like he might still be there. He was employed Midway Games yeah. fifteen years. Yeah, he's yeah. he's been he's worked on every Mortal Kombat title. Yep. From the first one to um to Mortal Kombat 11 in 2019. Yeah, 2019. That's right. You're the voice of Get Over here. Um that's amazing. That's he this this man's had a hell of a career. That's some cool shit. Um Yeah, that's that's wild though that he has managed to I I feel like outside of there's very few creators that get to stick with the series that they created for pretty much their whole career. And Oh god, yeah, that doesn't I want to say like Hideo Kojima was able to do it for the most part with Metal Gear. Um but yeah, the fact that Ed Boon has been able to just stay, you know, basically stay with first Midway and then as as the series got acquired, you know, as Midway and, and the companies got acquired, he just stayed with it. So, yeah, it's, it, it is impressive. That is not something you you see very frequently or at all, really. Yeah. So that's really. Amazing. So I wouldn't be surprised if if um, if uh, Jeff uh, consulted with Ed Boone on this. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Yeah. Uh, especially with we know how, you know, particular these publishers and 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 that sort of thing are with their franchises. Yes. So that, I'm I'm sure it has something to do with it. Yeah. yeah. So very interesting start. Let's see where it goes. I, I'm, I'm very curious, and it and it flies by. It is it, it is, is a, a quick read. It is a page turn. It is yeah. it is a quick read. It it moves fast. Um. Mm-hmm. So uh, that'll do it for tonight's episode. Uh. If you have the means a twitter account uh if twitter has not been bought by elon musk yet in the <laughs> in the intervening weeks since big ass. since we're recording this and and when that happens um if you can give us a follow on twitter at pixelit pod uh give us a follow on instagram also at pixelit pod check out our website pixelitpod.com um and rate us five stars on the platform that you listen to us on. And I believe that it's going to be uh, Apple, Apple iTunes, Spotify, and Audible allow for, for five-star ratings. So if you listen on one of those platforms, go ahead, give us a five-star rating, um, and share, share us with your friends, share us with your family, uh, share us with anybody who you think is vaguely interested in Video game Even a little. adaptations in uh, video game novelizations. Please. Please. We, we need your validation and support. We need your validation and support um, because that is how we pay ourselves through your validation. Exactly. And it's, it's delicious. It's so good. It's so good on fries, y'all. It's mm. like mayonnaise on fries. Yes. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's just enough. Just, just a, little. a little. You mix the mayo just with the ketchup and. Uh, yeah. It's delicious. It's good. Anyway, have a good night, everyone. Anyway, hungry. <laughs> <laughs>